Greetings, everybody, and welcome to a special installment of City Lights Live, the virtual extension of the City Lights events calendar. I'm your host, Peter Maravellis, and today we're delighted and honored to have with us two exceptional wordsmiths. They both have newly released books coming out, and they'll be reading from their collections. They'll also be in conversation with each other. It is a great pleasure to welcome Erica Lewis in conversation with A.H. Jared Avant. Both have distinguished themselves with some very exceptional work. As is customary at the outset of each event, I'd like to acknowledge that we are broadcasting to you from the ancestral homelands of the Ramatishaloni peoples. I would like to take this moment to pay respect to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. Erica Lewis is a poet whose work we've had the great pleasure of featuring in our past events programs here at City Lights. We've been following her work for some time now. Today, we are delighted to be celebrating the publication of the collection entitled Mahogany. It is the third in a trilogy of books, which includes Mary Wants to Be a Superwoman and the book Daryl Hall is My Boyfriend. The three collections explore a deeply emotional landscape mapping out terrain that is at once personal and public. Erica Lewis weaves together and connects the relationships between personal memories, place, the passage of time, and utilizes pop music as a kind of uniting thread. Mahogany continues the triptych journey with meditations upon family, intimacy, the impact of personal loss, and the search for what can bring us joy in everyday life. Erica's work has appeared in numerous anthologies and journals. These include Baum, The Brooklyn Rail, Entropy, New American Writing, as well as others. Her previously published books include Precipice of Jupiter from Q Books and Camera Obscura from Blaze Fox. Both collaborations with the artist Mark Stefan Finian and the solo project as well, Murmur in the Inventory, which was by Sherman's Books, along with some chapbooks from Yapolita Press and Lame House Press. It is always a pleasure to be able to host her. Joining Erica today in reading and conversation is A.H. Jared Avant. He is a writer, poet, and performer. His work has appeared in Mississippi Review, the Boston Review, Callaloo, The Baffler, the LARB Quarterly, as well as other journals. In August of 2020, he served as a guest curator for the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day series. His collection is titled Muscadine, and it's published by Four Way Books. This is his debut collection that we're featuring today. He is also a poet who has appeared upon City Lights Radar for many years now. We're honored to be able to celebrate this wonderful new collection, as well as Erica's, in this program of reading and discussion. So we've posted links in the description of the event with which you may purchase books by both poets. So it is a great pleasure to be able to welcome you both. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having us, Peter. Hi, big brother. Hey, Erica. <laughs> it's so good to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you too. It's good to be getting these books out in the world at the same time. I've been waiting for your book for such a long time. So I'm so happy to see it out in the world. It's something. It's something. It is. It is. What are we so, talk What are we going to talk about? Well, I want to know how Muscadine came about. I mean, what was your process of putting it all together? And I know it's probably a little similar to the way I put mahogany together, but I'd love to. I'd love to hear your journey. It was it was a process. I think it um, it wasn't by any means was it sort of streamlined or just sort of straight and narrow. It was it took me being introduced to different texts by different friends, um, thinking about what the title of a manuscript can do versus the order of the poems in a manuscript, how that functions, uh, the titles of the poems themselves, um, 
Hold on, it really just took like looking at every every little nut and bolt and making sure that I don't know it was doing the thing that I imagined it would do. I had a a lot of trouble ordering these poems because some of them are so very different from other poems. Um, but I also didn't want to just put put them in a section by themselves because I felt like they had a lot more to offer the texture of the manuscript if they were, um, I guess, more blended into the order of the manuscript as opposed to just quarantined to their own section. Um, and so just finding, trying out positions and seeing what poems fit best next to other poems. Um, I think the, I think the sort of, I think the tempo or the, the pace of the manuscript was important to me and, and not, and it not feeling like, uh, I don't know, it lagged anywhere. And so I wanted to sort of keep a certain pace or energy throughout the manuscript. Uh, and, and that sometimes helped me decide where a poem might land in the manuscript. Um, Were there any like personal things that helped you decide any personal things that happened that you wrote about and decided that that's, this is the book? You know what I mean? Like things happen in our lives and we have to write about them. And that sort of became your book, right? Well, I think, you know, probably at the center of this book is all of these elegies mm -hmm. for, people, um, for family members that I've lost since starting trying to write a book, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I knew that that was, I guess, since maybe 2000 and Eleven or twelve, I knew that that was going to be part of the center of the book. Um, me playing around with the elegy and the lives of the people who are most responsible for my own, um, and so these personal losses definitely, um, I think color how the book thinks about grief and loss and, and 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 tries to chart a path out of it or um through it so to speak um, i don't know were there were there um i don't know personal things in in your life that you probably couldn't see mahogany being mahogany without having experience. Sure. Sure. When I first started writing mahogany, well, so my whole vision for the, the trilogy I was writing about my family was mm -hmm. to, you know, have the books come out back to back to back. And the first two did, but um, this last one was really, really stumping me. I just couldn't get past, I'd say, half of the first section. And it's because I was going through like so much that everything just, you know, I couldn't function creatively. Um, my mom was really, really sick. Um, she was chronically ill for a number of years. And so for about five years, I went back and forth between San Francisco and Ohio, like living there for like six months and then living here in San Francisco for six months. And I did mm. that for like five years. Um, oh, wow. And so that really, really colored the book. You know, this mahogany was, so <laughs> ironically, 
mahogany was supposed to be about just like pure joy and like entering motherhood and you know having a child of my own which never panned out what wound up happening was literally the opposite um i was taking care of my mother and my mother passed away mm. and so yeah mm. that that is the book it was intended to be something else entirely and I couldn't write when my mother was was so sick. I just could not get into this book. And I, I look back now and I think, I didn't know what this book was about, you know? Mm -hmm. I was writing all this stuff and, and I thought it was headed somewhere, somewhere else. But when my mom died, I remember sitting in her bed a lot of things happen with me sitting in her bed, drinking wine, wearing her fur coat. Mm. That was that was part of my grief ritual. Oh, and I could, I could see <laughs> that's such a good image. I mean, that would that that would be such a good image, even if you recreated it, if you haven't captured it. Like, <laughs> I I think we've captured a little bit of it. <laughs> If you want to see the film, um, okay, we do a little film, yeah, I want trailer, to see whatever you want to call it. You want to see this? Um, but I, I, I was like, it's too good not to engage. <laughs> you have to have engaged this image some kind of way. Um, well, for me, it was a way of holding on to her, and it was a way of kind of maintaining some sense of normality while I'm living in my childhood house trying mm -hmm. to clean it out trying to get my mother's affairs in order and i just Dang. the last time we were together was in her bed we just we just lay there and watch really silly tv yeah. but yeah so that's how that started happening for me i literally sat in her bed one day and just started writing and I finished that book pretty much at her house. Shall we show the film now? Oh, we can show the film now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here we go. I'm no great pretender. If you can read this, you are alive. You're going to get your ass kicked, whether you're afraid or not. We recite ourselves to life. Remember that in your moments of grief or uncertainty, the body in contact with darkness, you must return to what birthed you. When the body rests, it heals black people in the hands of black people, an algorithm, became willing to see myself, refused to be knowable, would not believe the lie of permanence. You left me holding the bowl of honey. I can picture you in my arms right now. Let time happen. Step over the gravestone. Walk the periphery. Watch them put her in the ground to see the world again. Thought I could know the world. You don't know what hurt is. To let myself be alive. Your presence was no longer my burden my body this last winter, perpetual reconciliation. You want to pull away now. Everything is burning down around you. Do not be afraid to disappear. Be naked. Call me a lioness. 
The path isn't a straight line. Being an only child teaches you to apologize for every time I wasn't there. I swear like a sailor at the drop of a hat. Stay conscious of the apparatus, your hollows, composure. When we are separate and alone, what if what I want from you isn't new? Savagery is genetic. I'm sitting in my mother's house, wine drunk in the middle of her bed, wearing her mink coat, crying. I could kill right now. I can't die any slower. That was fun. Yeah. In the way. So I think it really captures kind of all of the feelings and even the landscape, you know, just rugged and broad. Yeah, the textures, that's, that was one thing I noticed. Like there were so many sort of different textures, a lot of rough cracking breaking that was my life <laughs> oh my definitely God. was my life i mean it does feel like that when you're um i mean unfortunately i can identify with um you know having been a caregiver for a parent and yeah. you know you're sitting there watching this whole thing, this person's life fall apart, faculty by faculty, but just, I mean, the speech, the swallowing, the squeezing your hand, like, and it's, I don't know, it's, 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 it's the wildest, I think, thing I've ever, Mm -hmm. experienced and even dared to sort of try and write about um I wasn't writing this past I guess November and December when I was when we were back here with mom in the hospital but I did I was writing down ideas about things that I wanted to write um and things that I was you know sort of taking paying special attention to in the moment that I didn't want to forget whether it was a feeling mm -hmm. or something somebody said or a circumstance or uh, a time of day or, I don't know uh, but I don't know I I didn't I didn't I didn't know what to expect from the film but I like that I like that it captured the textures of so many of them the emotions it also captured a little bit of the crazy <laughs> you know that craziness that you feel because everything's out of control yeah yeah yeah. you don't have yeah 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 right. mm -hmm. and i think too maybe this might be part of the greek ritual i think it was good to 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 make it to document it that way. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's definitely something we have in common, the loss of our relatives, now ancestors, and how they work it, they work their way into our writing. Yeah. Yeah. I um, you know, I was that so I was here with mom all summer and then August, I moved to Connecticut, and then November came back until until she died. And so I was taking making photographs the whole time, 
Yeah, and I saw some of them. I've got all of these film photographs that I haven't done anything with except for organized. And so I think the next thing that I want to, that I'm going to probably put in time and energy in the right is um, maybe a book of essays on these objects, these, uh, you know, physical objects that I've hoarded <laughs> to keep uh, folks close to me that I've lost, you know, stuff from mom, stuff from yeah. dad, stuff from champ. Um, and so when I think about, when I sit and think about one of these objects, you know, it takes my mind, like I can go so many, like I can, I can only go so many places given the object because of the meaning of the object or the life that the object lives, you know. Um, Your so, photographs are beautiful. I have to say that. Everything you. that you post <laughs> is just so, there's so much attention to detail. And I really feel like I'm looking through your eyes at whatever you're focusing on. They're really gorgeous. Well, I hope I can manage to put, manage to pair some of these photos with some of these essays. Um, and I don't know, I feel like in the next year, some time might clear and I'll be able to dedicate some time to that. Um, I hope so, because man. Yeah. It'll be good. It'll be good to It'll be good. Hear and I don't know, I feel like I know a lot of people who um, are, I don't know, can I ask, is, is it offensive if I ask you how old you are right now? <laughs> I it's feel, not, a, I, I'm, not I'm, offensive. I'm, you can I'm, ask all you want. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm 42, and I feel like I know a lot of 40-year-olds who are, who are either just coming out of being a caretaker for their parents or... Yeah caretaking for their parents currently um, and and I feel like it's a it's an untapped network of yeah. people that could benefit from each other being in conversation with each other um, and so you know part of the work of books I don't know I feel like like mahogany like muscadine is to to heal people. Put energy to heal yourself. Into, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. I think that's exactly, that's like the most true thing. I feel like when you can't hide what's going on in your life, you know, you can't put on the happy face every day anymore. And you finally have to start talking real talk and, you know, mm -hmm. there's no guys anymore. You know, when you say I, you mean I, you don't mean some like netherworld I right. off to the future. Right. I think I, like it, the people in our age range, I feel like they... <laughs> I'm still not going to tell you. I, I, know, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't even ask those. <laughs> people in our age range are also coming to a place where you can't do anything but you know except be yourself you just run out of mental energy you run out of physical no, energy you don't, you, don't, you don't have the desire <laughs> you don't have the desire you don't have the the time Exactly. <laughs> so all of these works are coming out that I think are so true because there's just no other way to live, right? There's just really no other way to live. Sharing yeah. our truths and our stories and a lot of our family becoming our ancestors. And, you know, there's, you know, there is, there is, some joy in knowing 
that there's this uh what did you call it like bond between all of us there's some joy in knowing that you know we could talk about certain things that nobody else <laughs> would understand right right you know? right right it feels like a it feels like a, a it feels like a small fraternity yeah. kind of kind of thing unfortunately but i mean not necessarily because we all gotta um we all got to leave, but I don't know. It's better to to be going through it and you know that somebody else has done it or is doing it um, and is in a similar boat. Um, I think we bring each other joy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Can I hear... A couple of your poems. A couple of poems. Do you decide what you're going to read before you read, or do you decide right before you, like, in the moment? It's so different this time. I usually have a couple of set lists put together. And I have an idea of what I want to read and where I want. I try to tell a story yeah, yeah, yeah. through the, you know, whatever, 10, 15 minutes I have. But yeah. for some strange reason, um, mahogany is guided entirely by the emotion of the moment, reading from it. You know, I've tried putting together little set lists, but I don't stick to them in the moment my heart feels like it's got to go someplace else, you know? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it's not winging it, but it's just kind of like intuitively going through the poems in the moment and reading what feels right. All right. I'm going to read... We were being detained. Before the 36 of us could bless the food, he called us out of the names we resist leaving. Quick to accuse the room of rearranging to kill him when no one ever begged his fall. An impulse born in him to drag us flat across a floor we weren't on and we embarrassed quiet. Laugh and throw pillows to save necks from the corners of coffee tables. All the scared children, their urgent questions we wish we could unfold for them, rattle us. I want to vanish from this detainment. Leave only this body in the room for the all-star picture who should have made it to the league, can't control his saliva. None of this melts down before the wise of stale entertainment. I say to my guests, let's just go fix our plates together. Too hungry to let him finish. The lips in the room, too cold to be kissing. I wanted him to stop what he wouldn't stop so bad. I wanted to see the night zipped up again to kill what always happens to him until what happens to him is cut out. You know how like old folks used to be like, cut out all that mm -hmm. messing around and going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I miss my old folks. I grew up with um I grew up with not just my aunts and uncles, you know, but I grew up with the old people. I grew up with um, my mother's aunts and uncles. Yeah. And yeah. So you know what it's like yeah. when the old folks start playing the dozens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know that feeling, just being around all that chucking and driving and all that history 
and like you feel you feel you feel like nothing can touch you you feel this yeah. sense of protection yes like yes something, like there's so much that has like when you're around elders like that aunts uncles great aunts great uncles grandparents like there's so much that has to be penetrated to touch you and and yep. I, don't, I feel like that's the only that's one of the only places i've ever felt that feeling um i know that feeling i do i never had babysitters i always had um I would stay with my great aunts, Aunt Lou and Aunt Chris. We'd yeah. always stay with my my dad, with my mom's sister, my Aunt Shirley, or my mom's, my maternal yeah. grandparents. Yeah. There's something about being brought up by different generations like that. Like, I learned my numbers by my great aunt playing cards. You know how the old folks would sit around playing cards? <laughs> Solitaire and... Yeah. I don't even think they play Tonk anymore. People play Tonk. They play Tonk in Memphis and Arkansas. All right. <laughs> they play Tonk and Beard Whist and Gin Rami and Spades. And my, 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 my dad's sister, who's in Arkansas, married an Air Force. And, and so they were in the military a lot. And that's all they fucking did was play cards. So. Yeah. <laughs> But I love that poem. Can you be another one? Um, let's see. Um, I'm still kind of like learning the book, like where the pages are. Uh huh. I hadn't gotten the color coded sticky notes yet. I need to fill the tabs. I need to do that before I get to the name. Um. All right. Here's a poem. A reason to get back. This poem is a part of, I guess, this group of palindromes that show up in the book. And, you know, they're really not, I don't know, whenever I read them, I ask whoever's listening to sort of turn off your natural inclination to sort of pull meaning from the words that you're hearing. And instead, mm -hmm. just pay attention to the sounds that the words are making. Because uh, okay. I, I think the intention with some of these palindromes um, is to just play with the sonic qualities of the language that I'm sort of using. All right, a reason to get back. Bush hogs over feet drain draws. Gushing dogs go for treats, rain, fall. Slush and frog sober sweet, James Jones. Brushing fogs off under peak night fall. Rushing hogs off up on meek freak hall. Pushing flogs off us in the reeking white zone. Pushing flogs off us in the reeking white zone. Russian hogs off up on Meek Freak Hall. Russian fogs off under peak night fall. Slush and frog sober sweet James Jones. Gushing dogs go for treats rain fall. Bush hogs over feet drain draw. That sounds like a song. <laughs> a song mm -hmm. <laughs> you're a weird song <laughs> but you asked me to just listen right yeah 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 and the way that you read it it sounds like a song it sounds like both the lyrics and the music you're making both as you read it 
Well, I, well, I think the point is to try to sort of treat language as if it were treat words as if they were musical notes. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I like that subversive, the subversive undertones of that. Um, given our relationship with this language. You know. um, so what, go ahead. Nothing. I was gonna ask. I was. I was gonna to turn toward you to read something, but oh, I've been trying to <laughs> avoid that. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll read something. Um, I'll read a couple of my favorite pieces. Okay. From the book. What number of book is this for you, Erica? Three. In in general, what number of book? Yeah. Is this your This is like my sixth or seventh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Respectfully, I say to thee, the story of the black cowboy began when our ancestors were brought to this country against their will. The first Kentucky Derbies were won by black jockeys. One out of four cowboys in the West were black. Every day I suddenly feel I want to die. Kanye West, BH1 Storytellers, full show. The Dark Night of the Soul. Positive Disintegration soul loss, or the descent to the underworld. Negretto, as Carl Jung understood it. St. John of the Cross. I am not having a crisis of faith. I am having a crisis of purpose. Oscura Noche. Take off my robes and step into the choir. Faith flickers as illness or realization. You don't know who you really are. The so-called physical, material, industrial plan for living. To go from emergence to emergency. Sometimes I override my wiser self, and here we are. There is no logic or feeling in loss. If you turn away, it will slowly devour you. Kyrie, a homesickness for a place that never was. I don't think people think about me the way that I think about them. Miss Red still is shit. Unity is shit possible. You are a dancer who was always really pissed. You were conditioned, assumed, or habitual. That really isn't in alignment with who you are. Tireless thought can easily burn you out. When I surrender, I am an absolute mess. To take night literally would be a mistake. Happiness and sadness, the rest of the world, the beginning of a way out. A black cowboy could sit on a bull for half a day and still not win any money. You know, you know that feeling when like, let's say maybe you were at home with mom and maybe it was a busy week and 
you were stuck in a mood and you had to go to this place and be around these people and be in a lot of different situations, but you feel the same in the inside, regardless of how happy you're supposed to be at this function or mm -hmm. if you're supposed to be at that function. And the yeah. voice, the voice in that poem that you just read feels like the voice I needed to hear in moments like that you know when you're when you're just stuck in that i don't know if it's depressive or whatever mood it is and can't shake it regardless of your environment mm -hmm. that voice in that poem feels like the voice that could pull you out of um, being numb to everything around you I'm very familiar with feeling numb that way, everything around me, especially you're dealing with one thing, you're dealing with the big, the big thing. And there are all these little things going on around you. And I say going on around you because you can't fully engage with them. You know, there's no you in any of it. It's, you know, going through the motions. And I call that, that's part of being dead inside. You can go through these things, go through the motions, but you're dead inside. Like I went through very long periods where I couldn't feel anything. Mm -hmm. Like that numbness yeah. is just yeah. overwhelming and yeah. you just can't feel anything. So. That's what that's the place where some of these poems are coming from. Yeah. You know? I mean, I think I think I think in in large part the palindromes are coming from that place because, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm keeping the vowel structure of what I'm calling an originating sentence and then using that vowel structure to populate the other sentences, the other five or six sentences that are gonna repeat. And so the vowels, are, the vowels are staying the same from sentence to sentence, but the only thing is changing are the consonants. And so I'm sort of keeping, you know, that vocalization sound that's always coming from the throat, which is replicating that feeling, whatever that feeling is that you're feeling, that you're stuck in, that dead inside feeling. And then you know, the the consonants sort of help it travel and 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 exploit that not being able to shake that feeling. Um, I want to yeah. read one final poem to you. Yeah. Um, it's the last poem in the book. And I think it kind of expresses what we were just talking about. Okay. I feel so broken hearted. The Lord is helping me in small and important ways. Watches the YSL show. Runs herself through the ringer. There are two kinds of forgetting an infinity of dead before me. Flowers grow out of my grave. Things change around you. You rest in the inevitability of things. Ignore your desire. Stop suffering. Give away your possessions. I came down from that cloud. America makes us all artists, sees migrants as modern slaves, lies about instinct because blood doesn't lie. We are all combustible. What if I stopped and just sat with who and what I am? Walk through the doors that are. Say this is a good day to take some deep breaths and remember love. I think about you often. All I want to do is be together. 
I've been depending on the overgrown. Something else I want to leave you with. In the deep, dark, horror trenches of healing, I choose you again. Some people never let you go. Empathy becomes expensive when you have empathy for everyone but yourself. I want to be loved as a choice, not as a reward. Sometimes the best choice is the one that's easiest to live with. Maybe you just learn lessons. I can't remember the last time something wasn't going to shit. Long summer days. If I never get well. I am looking at the fucking sun. Sometimes the universe. All my whiskey. This is the way to remember. I miss you. I'll be there after why. We live in a perpetually burning building. I felt only softness. My open wounds having no place. I'm on my way home. Everybody say glory. Thank you. Yeah, I think that does capture exactly what we were what we were talking about. I love it when I love it when you when you slip into dialogue with the lost like, mm -hmm. when the voice in the poem is in direct address to the to the thing we're trying to keep alive you know um, I love that so good. the thing I'm trying to keep alive that's very much what this whole book is for me yeah. the thing I'm trying to keep alive yeah. 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 My my brother my brother would come home. I'm sure if I were not here, and probably get rid of a lot of the jar jellies and preserves and cha cha and stuff in the kitchen. But I would never, <laughs> even if I don't ever eat none of them, <laughs> I would never get rid of them because her energy is in them. You know, uh, they ain't, as long as they ain't bothering nobody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. when I was at my mother's house I was I stayed there for six months in Ohio after she passed away and I clung to everything mm. everything she left a freezer full of food mm. and then she left a deep freeze outside <laughs> full of food and that's what I ate the entire time I was there. It's the stuff that my mom prepared. It's like she prepared that for me. She knew it was going to come a time when somebody didn't have the time, energy, or will to probably fucking cook. Um, so my yeah. mother always, always taking care of me. Yeah. You know? Yeah, like, like realizing... I think privately a couple of times I realized ways in which mom had taken care of us like while she was here, like for after she's gone. Mm -hmm. um, and just the way that that pierced and humbled me and, and made me feel really really bad about times where I wasn't as grateful as I should have been mm. you but know you're human Say that mom, again. you're human right and, right right and, and mom knows your mom knows you're human mom right. knows you're human 
right 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 and to you know just survive that and then i don't know it's so much it's so much room for i guess emotional elasticity Mm -hmm. attached to grief like you can Mm -hmm. like it's a huge range (laughs) of shit that you can feel I love that we've talked about it because, well, at least for me, I haven't sat down with anyone to really talk about this work from mahogany that way. Someone who's close to it and doesn't know they're close to it. Someone who's going through what we've been through. I think we've been through very similar circumstances. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I hadn't talked to I haven't gone here about this work either. Um, so it, it does feel good to to get to plop down on a topic, you know. Will you read one more poem for me? Okay. Um, Rocks. Another Uncle Nudie poem. You're given the vehicle to pull through curves of a road the county came to grade last week. And you're on your way to grab a man to live in your house who can't live in his own house, whose feeding tube allows him to eat through the houses he lives in. You think the full trip back with him and forth in a sway, wishing you were not this nephew behind this leather wheel. He braces himself for violent drugs the doctors are sure will weaken him. It look like we gonna get some rain today, I say, with a trail of dust clouds and the gravel knocking beneath the truck. I wait for a phrase I can make out or a word I can mold a question around as cranial nerve eight works to pull sentences for mere sounds. He commits to dialogue with the throat feel with rocks the oncologists say the oncologists can't move a piggish disease knotted throughout his fairings that don't clean the way i've seen rocks clean in creeks the odo folk make a team of white coats you can't get on the phone and i don't want to say i don't want to be here no matter it's truth no matter the sum of worry studying these days I'm in too thick of a bond with disease, treading the loose gravel of a sharp bend, signaling into a difficult turn. I love that image of the rocks, the rocks in the creek, cleaning everything. Thank you for sharing your work. I appreciate it. And I can't wait to continue this conversation in LA. Oh, wow. Next week. Next week. Next week. Next <laughs> week. It's happening. Yeah. Peter's back. Peter's back. Yeah. Hey, I, I want to thank you both for your candor, your honesty. I mean, also, 
man, that's some courage there to be this intimate. I really, really appreciate you gracing the virtual halls. And it's been an honor. No, thank you. Congratulations, man. Just some great work. I mean, what can I say? So really happy to be featuring you both. Um, I'm going to let everyone know we posted uh, links. Please buy books. They're uh, in the event description. Uh, also, come on down, browse our stacks. We got one of the biggest poetry selections in the country. City Lights is located in San Francisco's historic North Beach District. We're open seven days a week, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. This broadcast has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through events like this one, our publishing program and educational outreach. It's all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. Righteous, thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you, Peter. No, thank you, man.